Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Rudy Potenzone, uh, and I'm the VP of Marketing for Transmart Foundation. Uh, we will be having our training class this morning, which is a special class for the attendees at the Datathon, which will take place next week in Boston. Uh, again, welcome to the, uh, our training class uh, this morning. Uh, we are going to be covering today uh, a brief introduction to the Transmart platform. Uh, Kristen Sweet from Thomson Reuters will be uh, giving the, the uh, lecture and go through some of the key capabilities uh, and highlights of um, the platform, some of the capabilities and uh, the data sets that we'll be using uh, for the Datathon next week. Um, this is the um, the first of a set of, three, of four webinars this week, each day at this time during the week. I will be covering uh, a different aspect uh, of um, what we'll be doing next week. Um, the other sessions on Tuesday will be a webinar that, re that goes through the, the actual operation of the Datathon, what our goals are, how the, the days will be organized, uh, and uh, a description of uh, the Datathon process itself. Uh, this is by Keith Elston, Ken Kubota. On Wednesday, uh, we will have a lecture from uh, our colleagues from the University of Luxembourg uh, who have been working uh, on Parkinson's disease uh, specifically, uh, and they have curated a number of data sets uh, that are of interest, which they will describe, um, and uh, also show a Parkinson's uh, map, a model of, of a model of Parkinson's uh, and Galaxy, uh, and also discuss some of the work that they've done on the curation of the ADNI data set. And finally, on Thursday, a couple of the vendors who will be at the Datathon and have their tools available for the participants, uh, specifically Perkin Elmer describing Spotfire and IO Informatics, describe their tools. Uh, and again, these, will, uh, these folks will be at the Datathon uh, and offer um, their tools for, for use. I'm uh, very pleased to introduce uh, Kristen Sweet, who will be um, conducting the rest of this class. And I'll be back on at the end, and we will have uh, a question and answer period uh, at the end of the session as well. But if you do have questions as we go along, uh, please post them in the uh, in the window. Okay. All right, great. Thank you, Rudy, for the introduction. Okay. So as, as Rudy said, my name is Kristen Sweet. I'm from Thomson Reuters. And uh, my colleague, Eugene, will also be doing some of the training, demonstrating some of the R interface stuff uh, after following me. So um, I have the platform open here. Hopefully, you're all able to see my screen that I'm sharing. And I wanted to. Uh, reiterate what Rudy said that we've also made some training videos. Um, they're short YouTube videos going over some of the same material in uh, less detail, um, but they're also a good refresher um, and covers the same types of data and analysis that we'll be going over here. So um, those links will be up on the Transmart Foundation website and feel free to um, look at those or uh, share them with your colleagues if you want a quick refresher. So um, for those of you who are new to Transmart, um, this is Transmart. So um, I've opened up Transmart to the Analyze tab. And what you can see is that there are two panels to the screen. There's the left-hand panel, and this is where your data actually is. And then your right-hand side of the screen, um, I like to say this is where you kind of do the work. So this is where you're going to be creating your cohorts and running analyses and doing that sort of thing. So um, because this data set is new to most of you and I wanted to show you what's available and kind of get you excited about the types of analyses that you can do, um, I wanted to take a couple minutes and go through the data that we have and explain it a little bit more and show you where things can be found. So in this first tab, this is uh, Geo Studies. So these are public data sets that have been curated, and these are studies that are related to, um, to the fields. And then if we go under public studies, there's a couple more uh, Geo data sets available. 
And then really the, the data that I think will be of most use to you and has the broadest amount of information is under this tab of private studies. And that's where I'm going to be focusing today. So you see that there's the ADNI data set from Alzheimer's and then there's three Parkinson's studies. So for today, I'm going to be showing you the PPMI data set um, because it's the one that I've had the most exposure to. Um, but I do want to just kind of open up a couple and point out to you that all of these studies are curated in a, curated in a very similar manner, and that's to help the user be able to find information across different studies in a pretty easy way. So um, assessments is going to be all of your questionnaires and measurements that were taken uh, for the subjects. Uh, we have some imaging data. We have subject information. Enable you to easily find things. If you see it in one data set, be able to move into another data set fairly quickly to replicate your findings or see if something uh, carries over in into another group of patients. So like I said, I'll be focusing on the Parkinson PPMI data set. Uh, so let's talk about uh, what these things mean. So the number in parentheses next to the folder is the number of subjects for which data is available. So you see that we have 1,307 uh, patient level data. Um, and not all of the data is for everyone. So we see that you know slightly less than that. Uh, have assessment data. Um, we may have patients who didn't, you know, who screened out or whatever. Um, and so I'm going to go through the data that's available in each folder. So under your subjects folder is going to be your baseline data for the patients who are enrolled. So there's family history. Um, and if I pull this over, where you'll be able to see a little bit more. Um, so there's family history, which is uh, you know relatives who are diagnosed with Parkinson's disease and some information there. Um, we have the demographics tab. This is going to be your you know baseline general demographic information regarding the subject. So we have age, sex, race, um, ethnicity, that kind of thing. Um, one thing make note of that we particularly useful for you is this appropriate diagnosis. Um, so this is where you're going to see what your subjects have in terms of disease. So um, a lot of the examples that I'll be talking about today, I'll be comparing Parkinson's versus healthy controls versus um, this SWED. So that's it for the subjects tab. We also have medical history information on all of these subjects. So this includes some vital signs, the physical examination data, neurological exams at baseline, some medical history information uh, for different organ systems, adverse events, medications that patients are on, and so forth. Under the imaging data, we see um, the uh, MRI and imaging results. Enrollment tab is going to be your flags for inclusion, exclusion, consent received, um, sub-study if they have uh, data available or not. So that might be helpful in filtering out what subjects you want to use in your analysis. The biomarkers tab under an analysis results shows the different type of data that's available. So um, the great thing about this data set is that there's tons of markers that were collected. So we have RNA data, plasma, DNA, uh, cerebrospinal fluid, and blood data. And so you can open up this tab and find out a little bit more about uh, what markers were measured. Um, and then under assessment, these are your questionnaires and your other uh, markers that were measured during the study. So you can see that they are broken down into motor and non-motor assessments and questionnaires that were taken. So obviously I don't expect you to memorize this and it takes some figuring out of where the data is, um, but I just wanted to give you at least the first glimpse so you can see the types of things that are available to you. So I wanted to also point out to you 
the types of data and what that means. So you see that some data has a 1, 2, 3 next to it and some has an ABC next to it. So 1, 2, 3 is um, numeric data as you might expect. So um, this is, you know, long, uh, numeric data that can be used um, in analysis and then you also have categorical data which is indicated by the ABC. So um, let's talk about how we can use this data. So like I said, your right hand screen is where you're going to be creating your cohorts. And so there's a lot of different ways that you can build your cohorts to really fine tune and drill down on the population that you want. So to start with something kind of simple, let's look at Parkinson's disease versus normal subjects. So in order to do that, you can take your mouse and put it over Parkinson's disease and click. And you're just going to drag it and drop it into the right hand panel into the first box of subset one. And so you notice that like if my pointer isn't in the box that I get a red X mark, but as soon as my pointer is inside the box, uh, I get an OK mark and I can release. Okay, so to compare that to control, you can just drag healthy control into subset two. Okay, so now to look at this data, we can click on summary statistics. And what this is going to do is it's going to automatically populate the baseline demographic information, just comparing these two cohorts. So um, you see the first uh, boxes just show you what it is that you set up. So you compared Parkinson's disease versus healthy control. We have 487 Parkinson's subjects and 241 healthy controls. These are really exclusive, so we want to make subjects that overlap and have both. We have a histogram relations breakdown and the racial breakdown for these two groups. So um, this is a very simple cohort, um, but like I said, we can go back to this comparison tab, which is where we started off, and we can build some pretty complicated cohorts here. Perfect. So picking up where we left off, um, if we wanted to compare things by an OR function, so if we want to look at patients with Parkinson's disease or SLED, so this is an inclusive join, we can put them in the same box, which is what I did here. Um, so now if we go to summary statistics, um, it's going to show us the information for subjects who have um, either SLEDS or Parkinson's disease compared to normal. So you see that our total number for subset one went up, and now it joined it by an OR. Okay. So the other thing we can do here is if we wanted to um, filter down and join things by an end function, so, for example, if we wanted to look at only the males in these two cohorts, we can go here and under sex we can find males and we can put it in this box here. And remember that if you want it to apply to both cohorts, you have to put it in both uh, boxes. And so now this is going to drill down and include only subjects who are male. Um, and so, as you can imagine, you can do um, a lot of fine tuning to really drill down into the population that you want. Um, you can also use numeric data. So if we wanted to filter only um, with subjects who are under or above a certain age, we can put this here. Um, and so the first thing I usually do is hit show histogram. And then it's going to show you the age distribution for the whole population. Then you can hit um, show histogram for subset. So this is going to look at only the patients who are in your subset one and um, show you the distribution just for them. And then you can filter um, by clicking by numeric value. And you see there's an array of options, less than, greater than, equal to. Um, so if we wanted to do, you know, subject less than 60, we can do that. Um, and the other thing I wanted to point out is notice that we started with only three boxes and now there's four. Um, this is 
kind of endless, so you can keep kind of adding boxes and boxes. You're not just restricted to three different um, ways to create your cohorts. And then the other thing that we can do here um, is this exclude button. So sometimes it's easier, like in this case, there's three different uh, gender options. Um, it might be easier than putting both female ones to just put male and then hit exclude. And that's going to say all the subjects that are not male. So um, if you create a cohort that you find is really useful, um, maybe complicated, you want to save it for later so you don't have to redo this or remember what you did, you can click on Save Subset. And so you can put in the description. So I'll just you know, put my name. You have the option of making it public, so this will share it with other users. And you can click Save Subset. And so um, if you look now, uh, we were in the Summary Statistics tab. It bumped us over to this Workspace tab. And here you can see the cohorts um, that I created here. This is the date it was created. It's not public, um, although we can unlock it and make it public. You can delete it. You can send a link to someone. Um, and you can also click to use it. And what that'll do is it'll just override whatever's in the comparison tab and build that cohort so um, you can just repopulate it again. So um, to clear this, we can click individually on each X mark. Um, or you can just click in the corner here, this clear button, and it'll clear everything. Okay? So um, that's what I want to show you as far as building cohorts. Um, and now I'm going to go into actually using the cohorts and the things that we can do with it. So let's start with um, a more simple analysis, and let's just look at um, Parkinson's disease versus healthy controls. So create our population, go to summary statistics. It's going to automatically populate the baseline demographic information for these two populations as we've seen before. All right, so now how do we run an analysis? Um, if we wanted to look at a certain SNP and see if it's maybe uh, associated with Parkinson's disease, we can do that by just adding that analysis on top of the cohorts that we created. So find the data that you're looking for. In this case, um, I want SNP data, so I'm going to go into DNA. And if we pick a SNP, you see that here are the polymorphisms here. And we can just click the entire study folder and drag it and drop it into the right-hand side to compare between those two populations that we've set. So here we see for subset one, the distribution of the um, variance. And here's the same for subset two. You see a table showing the summary of the breakdown for each, um, each type between these two groups. And then you see that automatically a chi-square test is run and a p-square uh, p-value is generated. Um, and so this match seems to be associated with Parkinson's disease versus uh, healthy control. So um, you can also do this using numeric data. And uh, I'll show you what that looks like because it's a little bit different. So um, let's go into uh, this Montreal Cognitive Assessment Score. Um, and so if we wanted to compare the Cognitive Assessment Score at week 24. We can find this week in here um, and put it in the right-hand panel. So now we see that a histogram is plotted here with subset 1 in uh, so our Parkinson's disease in red and our healthy controls in blue. We see the same data also plotted as a box plot here. And we see summary data, the mean, median, IQR, standard deviation, and the total number of points. Um, now, since this is numeric data, the appropriate test is a t-test, so it automatically just does it for you. And a p-value is then also calculated for that t-test. So um, that is basically how you can run the kind of simple analyses. 
And notice that if we scroll down, everything that we ran previously is going to still be here. So we can um, find that data right there. So um, now I'll go into some of the advanced analyses that we can do. So to do that, let's go back to the comparison tab. And to give us the most flexibility to use the advanced workflow that we're going to use here, um, the best thing is to put the entire study folder in the box. Um, and actually, before I do that, I just want to show you one more thing um, that I skipped over. So let's go back. Parkinson's versus healthy control. Um, we saw our summary statistics. You can also view this data in a little bit of a different format by clicking on grid view. And what that's going to do is going to populate a subject level table showing the uh, information that you have run. So um, whenever this guy opens, we'll be able to see um, for each subject the age, the gender distribution, here we are, um, the subset, so here's our subject ID, um, here's the uh, gender, the age, the race, and then we have, these are our Parkinson's subjects. If we scroll down, we'll see our healthy control subjects here. Um, and any analysis that we do, so example, if we put this SNP data back in here, it'll add a row in this table. And N is for subjects who don't have uh, that parameter measured. So this is helpful, um, and it's particularly useful if you want to export the data. So um, if you click on Export to Excel, it'll download this table. Um, do you want to open the file? Yes. And here it is. Um, so this is really helpful, especially if you wanted to then import this file into um, another platform for analysis. Um, although Eugene will show you a little bit later uh, some other ways that you can do that. All right. So back to what I was saying, let's go back, clear everything. And for advanced workflow, let's grab the entire study folder and put it in the box. And now we're going to click on advanced workflow. And you see this analysis tab. So these are all of the analyses that we can run. And so I'm not going to go over all of them. Um, the majority, they're you know, pretty self-explanatory and actually um, they do a really good job of explaining the types of data that you need for analysis and uh, kind of what to put in what box. Um, but just to show you for now, uh, one that I find especially useful is the box plot with ANOVA. So um, as you might imagine, for a box plot, we need an independent variable and a dependent variable. We need one thing to be numeric or continuous and the other one to be categorical. So you need you know, the data that will be plotted, and then you need the groups to be, that you're going to have in your plot. Um, so this I find really useful because if you remember in our comparison tab, you can really only compare two different groups. And sometimes people want to look at something across three groups, and that's where this comes in handy. So um, a question I get all the time is, how do I know which one to put as my dependent and which one to put as my independent? Short answer is, it doesn't really matter. Um, it's just going to flip your x and y axis. A little bit longer answer is, you know, your dependent variable is your x axis, so you usually, um, that's just going to help orient you. But it'll give you the same plot either way, just kind of flipped on its axis. So. If we wanted to compare healthy control, Parkinson, and SWED, we can put that here. And then um, let's compare that to numeric data. So let's just keep using this uh, cognitive assessment score. And we put that in this box. Um, high dimensional data, don't worry about for um, the purposes here. But if you do come across some data, particularly in the geo data set, that are, um, have a little DNA symbol next to it, and show you what that looks like. Um, but that indicates that the data is stored as high dimensional data, which is structured a little bit differently. Um, and then you have to click on the high dimensional data to run that. But anyway, going back to where I am. Okay, so we click run. Um, 
You also have the option here of enabling binning. So what binning does is if we wanted to compare two different numeric data sets, um, we can do that by just creating bins. I'll show you that. So here um, we have our three populations across the x-axis, and then we have a box plot for each um, cognitive assessment score uh, for each population here. If we scroll down, we see the ANOVA p-value. Um, we see the pairwise p-test values here, um, and as well as the mean and uh, count for each population. If we wanted to export uh, or download the data, we can do that here, and that'll export the um, raw subject level data, the plot itself, as well as the summary um, analysis. All right, so let me just show you quick um, if you wanted to do a numeric data and bin it. So let's just say we wanted to um, look at the month 24 data, but we wanted to stratify that by age instead. We could do enable binning. So which variable do we want to bin? Let's bin age. It's continuous. And we want to bin it, let's just do two groups and we want to evenly distribute the population, or, or, or we could evenly space the bins. Um, another option here is manual binning. So if I wanted to use a certain age as a cutoff, um, I could do that. And so what this is going to do is it's going to plot um, the same data, but now we have two bins, one of subjects who are age 22 to 64, and the other subject 64 to 93, and you see the score for these two populations. All right. So that is box plot. Um, so let's go into another analysis that I find pretty useful, and that is the line graph functionality. So this is helpful if you want to plot things over time. So um, we need one timer measurement concept, and then we need another concept of groups. So how are we going to break down that data? So for this, let's just use a different assessment. Um, so we can use this modified Schweb England activity score, and we can use the overall score. So um, here, if we wanted to look, let's say, to compare 6 months, 12 months, and 24 months. We just add all of them to the box here. And let's compare them again by disease subtype. Just keep it straightforward. So put those here. Um, and we don't need to bin. We could bin if we wanted to bin the groups, like I just showed you. Um, and let's go ahead and click Run. Uh, the default is mean with error bar. You could also do mean with standard deviation or median with error bar or plotting each individual person in the group. Um, and so here you see that in subjects who are the healthy controls, their cognitive assessment score stays about the same or maybe even goes up. Whereas you see kind of a decline in our patients with Parkinson's disease and threads over time. Okay, um, and then um, the last thing I want to show you here is about exporting data. Um, so if we want to export data, we can go to this Data Export tab. And what this is going to enable you to do is export all of the data for which you have in the Comparison tab right now. So. Um, So right now we have uh, the whole study folder under the comparison tab. So we're going to, if we exported the data, it would be for all 1,307 subjects. So you can click on that. Um, and it's going to by, uh, download all of the clinical and low dimensional biomarker data. So this is literally everything that we have. So um, we can click on export data. As you might imagine, this can take some time, so a large study. So um, something that I find helpful is you can click 
run in the background. And so that's going to put your data in this export jobs tab. So we go to that right here. And basically what that allows you to do is be able to keep doing stuff in the meanwhile. So um, we see that it's gathering the data right now. It's still kind of trying to run, whereas this one I had run previously and that one's completed. Um, and so you can hit refresh and that'll kind of double check what stage it's on. Um, but once it's done, it'll be a link and you'll be able to click on that uh, to be able to open and uh, download those results. So um, that is all I wanted to show you for today. Um, Eugene is going to show you another way that you can use the R interface to be able to um, also query the data and um, select the data that you want. Um, and Worked as a really good plugin for uh, running an analysis with other platforms or using R itself to do some uh, analysis. So. Um, if you have any questions for me, I'll take those now. Otherwise, I will pass it over to Eugene. If you have a question, you Maybe can raise your hand. Or any questions in the line? Nothing yet. If you have a question, you can raise your hand or put a question in the question window. And if no one has a question, we will move on. We'll also have time at the end for questions. If you think of something later, yeah. Okay. Well, and thank you all for your patience. I really appreciate it during a little technical glitch there. Thanks, Kristen. It's always uh, always exciting when these things happen. Uh, you Eugene? never know, right? <laughs> it's true. Okay, Eugene, I'm making your presenter. Are you there? All right. So, so my screen. Uh, can you see my desktop? No? Not yet, but um, it may be coming. You have to click show my desktop to do that. There you go. Yep, we see it. All right. Looks good. Um, yes, so um, thank you. And uh, I'm going to basically talk about this um, Transmart um, R client, which is basically a a uh, way to get the uh, transmart our server through the API and uh, retrieve the data from there and then uh, work with the data and do some more complicated types of analysis. And in particular, uh, the main advantage of um, using this, uh, although it's more advanced, is because you um, can compare uh, several studies at the same time, uh, assuming they have uh, common clinical parameters. Um, and so for this tutorial, I will basically look at the, uh, uh, also the TPMI study and the uh, BioFind study, and we'll see if we can uh, compare uh, them in terms of common parameters, right? Uh, anyway, so to get the uh, package, uh, you just need to you know, go to this uh, address, and then uh, that's the uh, GitHub, and then you can get the package from there. And the actual installation is straightforward, so you, you need to open some sort of R environment, and one of the best ones is to use the R Studio. Uh, so here I have the actual sample code that I will be using on this side. You can see all the variables that are loaded, the packages loaded, and here is the actual command um, environment. Uh, so um, to install the package, you basically need to run this command, which require, which installs the directed uh, packages like curl and JSON, get to the API, and then apply our hash and reshape to do some analysis. And then the actual installation command is uh, this one. And so here, instead of this type of package, you just need to specify the uh, package location that you have downloaded from GitHub. Um, so that's uh, pretty much it for the installation. And then to actually work with the package, uh, you just need to load it uh, the library, right? So we can run this. Uh, 
uh, command, or we can uh, even just check uh, the checkbox in this uh, package window, right? If we check it here, then uh, it will basically load itself, and we can tell it's already loaded. And also, um, if you click here, you can actually get to the documentation, and you can see that this package just contains uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, about ten functions that allow you to connect uh, to the TransMart um, API and uh, retrieve uh, different types of data from it. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's all it does. And again, the goal of this tutorial is just to show you how to use these few commands to do some basic operations and obviously not to teach you R in any way, but again, just to give you some ideas on how it can be uh, used for the analysis. Uh, so once you have loaded the package to actually connect to the transmart, you would need to use this uh, connect to transmart command from that package and uh, specify the address in there. So I'll just click run. Uh, well, yeah, it's the way it says that I have the connection, but basically, uh, the way it works is it will um, ask, you know, once you click this command, it will uh, provide you this um, link, which you just copy paste it in the browser, and uh, the browser will show you this uh, and a token, and then you will just need to copy paste that token uh, in that prompt, and again, it will just uh, authenticate and uh, establish the connection the API interface, right? So this would be, again, like, so if you type this, that link in the address, so this is this token, you just copy-paste it, put it into the SAR prompt, and it does the connection right here. Uh, all right. Um, so that's it. Uh, well, yeah, we can basically that. Uh, so there is uh, two types. So data in transmart one is the high dimensional data, which is some sort of expression data, and then uh, clinical um, data. And uh, basically, these four commands they deal with different ways of obtaining the clinical information, information about the overall tree uh, of the transmart. So the first command we will look at is this uh, get studies command, right? Uh, this one. So if we uh, just type it like this, it will save the uh, result of this command. And if we look at it, uh, you will see that it basically just prints the uh, like print mark tree, right? How we have it uh, in, on the server. And uh, the only thing that is useful for the further analysis from here is this actual um, study ID, right? So this is what you would need to specify in other commands to retrieve the information for the particular study. Uh, so to do that, so we will look then at the first command, which is called get subject. So it just retrieves the subject information or basically the demographic uh, information that Kristen had shown recently. Uh, so again, if you just type this get subjects command and specify this um, study ID, it will save the result of uh, this command into this variable. And we can look it again in the our studio, so you can basically see that uh, it does pretty much have all that uh, subject information about the race, marital status, uh, age, uh, sex, uh, etc. Uh, so yeah. Uh, next, uh, once you you know have a study of interest, you can then. Uh, retrieve uh, different concepts corresponding to each study. And so to do that, you, you do, you, you know, run this uh, get concept command, again, specify the study ID, and it will retrieve all the, all the nodes of the tree uh, in the transmark. Um, so again, we can, since the PPMI study is quite huge, it will take uh, quite, um, you know, basically several minutes uh, to, to run and get the results of this command. So again, I already have it in the saved environment, and uh, we can look at the results of this uh, PPMI uh, concept here, right? So we can basically see this is all this 
uh, tree structure, old tree structure with all the nodes and values of those nodes listed in this particular table. Uh, and again, if you, we can do the same for the biofind uh, study, and then uh, what we can do is we can, uh, you know, intersect the common concepts and see which, what, what are the actual common clinical parameters between these two studies, right? So we can do this with this intersect, which is just a regular R command, and then to look at uh, what's in that variable, uh, we can just, uh, yeah, print that variable value, and you can see, so these are the common um, parameters or concepts. So between these two studies. And for the next uh, analysis, we will look at the uh, rapid eye movement, rapid system, rapid eye movement uh, sleeping disorder questionnaire, right? So this is basically uh, a questionnaire. It has about 10 questions with yes or no answer. And it basically, uh, if, we, if you get high score, it indicates that there is some sort of neurological disorder uh, present. Right, the maximum score is 13 points. So what we will do, we will retrieve information for the both studies and then uh, build some box plots. Uh, so again, with this line of, uh, and again, like once we retrieve the data, the rest code is pretty much work in R, how you put all these uh, variables together. So here we will just uh, get uh, the structure of this uh, rapid time movement uh, questionnaire. And again, if we go back to the study itself, uh, we can look at it in the transmart tree first, right? and then we can see how it is in the structure. So if we look at the Parkinson 59, uh, uh, so this is rapid time movement, right? So this is all these different questions, right? And then like there is this total score. And we will basically need this total score information. Uh, okay. So again, we uh, subset this uh, TPMI concepts and search for the all the variables with the rate of eye movement, right? With this command, if we do that. And then look at this test results. So again, we basically see all that questions in, in there. And then uh, with the next command, we will retrieve all the information about the scores, right? So if I run that, again, we look at the test. You only see uh, different scores for different uh, visits. And we obviously need the total score right here. Uh, and so then, and yeah, one way of getting that score information would be you know, either just by typing the name or you can use this um, ID of the concept, right? Just type this ID in here. And so to get the actual observations, we will use this get observations command from the SAR package to specify the study name. And then we would either, you know, just type the name of the constant. And again, the reason I'm not using the name is because there are some other uh, you know, questionnaires that just have the same variable score, right? So it's hard to distinguish which score, which score is which. So better to use the precise ID of the concept. Um, and so we'll just uh, put this ID in here. And uh, when you run this command, again, it, it takes a uh, few minutes, uh, but it, it's quite a large study, but it retrieves all information and saves it into this RAM variable, which is basically a uh, list of data frames. So you can look at the, and it has this uh, basically three data frames in there. So if you look at the observations, you can actually see the actual uh, values uh, for each subject, right? So in different visits, you can see the uh, scores uh, during the visits for the for that person, then the subject info uh, retrieves pretty much the same information as the uh, get subject command, all that demographic uh, stuff about uh, sex, etc. Uh, and the concept info just retrieves the, retrieves the general information about the concepts, 
right? Well, that key structure. Uh, so when you have that, then what we will just need to do is basically to extract these observations, which we will do with this uh, command, right? Uh, so if I run that, and then we look at this uh, rapid die movement. Uh, so this is basically, again, we just retrieve it as a in table format uh, of this uh, scores for different visits for different patients. Okay. Uh, and the next, uh, what we will need to do is we will need to retrieve the diagnosis, right? If it's the Parkinson's patients or the uh, healthy patients, and then what we will look, we will look at the, if there is a difference in the rapid eye movement score uh, between the normal patients and the uh, Parkinson's disease patients, right? So again, we would need to go to a different um, uh, variables and then retrieve that information. So this is this number of commands that's doing that. So if I run it, uh, it uh, oh, again, it, now you can see that it's going live and connecting to the server and uh, retrieving the observations. Uh, and we can then look at the results. Uh, of this command here again. So here you can see this patients with the patient ID, and this is a Parkinson's disease or healthy control, or if it's sweat, right? Um, so now you basically we have two data frames: one with the rapid questionnaire result, and another is with diagnosis. So then we what we will need to do is to merge them into kind of one table and then we can start building box plots. So I'm doing this with this line of commands. And again, if I just run that, hopefully it works. Yeah, you can see here that it builds a box plot. Uh, and if we zoom in, so this is uh, various for the sweat patients. And then you can see the healthy control and uh, uh, basically the average, the box plot for the um, rapid eye questionnaire, total score for the healthy control, and then for the Parkinson's disease, and obviously Parkinson's disease patients have a higher end score indicating that they do have some sort of neurological disorder, right? Uh, and then we, we can do the same number of steps, right, which is right here, and get the same uh, observations for the biofine study, uh, and uh, when we have, when we obtain that, we can then uh, join the two data frames from both studies and then, uh, you know, just run a box plot for the two studies at the same time. Right? So if I run that, uh, again, you can see that uh, this is the biofine study. So again, there is a difference in the total score for the rated eye movement uh, questionnaire you know, with the Parkinson's have a higher score than the healthy control, and then you compare that to the uh, uh, PPMI study, right? Again, healthy control average is pretty much similar to healthy control in biofind, and this is uh, Parkinson's. And in, in biofind, it seems that the average, the, the score, the rapid eye movement is still slightly higher than in patients that, that were in the PPMI study. Anyway, so this is just gives you an idea on how you can retrieve clinical data and uh, do some analysis and compare even several studies at the same time. And again, just to reiterate, this is the uh, main advantage of using the R-type, the R-interface, although it's uh, more advanced and requires some more effort to do it. And the last example I will show is to how to actually retrieve the uh, expression data uh, for each study, and then we can see, uh, do some uh, box plot for the uh, uh, for the expression data, similar again to what Kristen was showing you. And again, it's possible to do that for several studies at the same time. So here we'll actually use a different study. Uh, this is some sort of breast cancer study. Uh, it's all worked out, turned out. But anyway, so um, uh, to retrieve high dimensional data, uh, we will use the get high, high, high dimensional data command. Again, we specify the study ID. Uh, also, you would, again, probably login just to show how it looks in the tree. 
So I knew this uh, breast cancer study that I have right here, and we can see we have this high-dimensional data there on this biomarker folder with the breast tumor, and then we will look at the uh, estrogen receptor uh, status of those breast cancer tumors. We will basically compare gene expression for the estrogen receptor negative versus positive breast cancer. And again, during, during the data data tone, you should be able to run similar things for the expression studies that are loaded um, in, the, uh, in the server for that purpose. Uh, so, yeah, it, it will take a few uh, minutes to you know, get that uh, those high dimensional data uh, when we run this command. And the way it looks, uh, it will basically uh, look like something like this, right? So we connect to the server and download about 30 megabytes of that expression matrix, and then it unpacks it, and then um, the results are saved into this uh, variable, right? And again, this variable is a list of two data frames. One has the actual uh, values for the uh, probes for that particular platform uh, corresponding to different patients, and the other is a hash uh, which contains uh, mappings of probes with corresponding gene symbols, basically the platform file information. So once we retrieve the uh, expression data, we will then again extract the actual expression data using this command right here. Right? So it's like, uh, Run that, right? Then we will look at this express uh, version data frame. So we can see that it's again patients, uh, patient IDs, uh, the type of uh, sample, it's the breast tumor, again from the transplant tree. And these are the actual uh, probes, with, in this case with the Z scores, right? Uh, so when we have the expression data, then we again need to group this matrix where we'll, we will add the phenotype information. So again, we're doing this using this uh, number of commands. And then basically uh, we would retrieve the information about the probe, right? Uh, so again, it looks at that second data frame uh, of this uh, expression data variable. Uh, so if, again, if I run just this command, uh, I can look at its results, right? So you can see estrogen, uh, again, data frame. So then let's run a couple more. Uh, and then if we look at this, the result of the few commands, so you can basically see that we have and extracted all the probes that correspond to the estrogen receptor gene, right? And these are all the patients right here, and then the expression value uh, of the disease course reflected. Uh, and uh, the next command again is basically add the phenotype information, right? So if we type that, should add the phenotype information. So you can see it's this, uh, if it's a breast cancer, uh, estrogen receptor positive or negative subtypes, right? And uh, then when you have it, you can build a uh, box plot, hopefully. Um, so again, this is a box plot of the expression of the estrogen uh, receptor gene, and we basically averaged those nine probes, right? So this is the average uh, averaged uh, expression of the estrogen receptor gene. And you can see that uh, the actual expression is in the negative one, in the negative subtype of breast cancer is uh, lower than in the positive, which is how it should be. Right. And uh, yeah, once you have uh, that, you can, it's also possible to do uh, more complicated things, like we can build uh, custom you know, dashboards 
So in this case, we can use the shiny app and see uh, we can launch a dashboard. Uh, so it will allow us basically to just type the gene symbol for any gene of interest and just uh, query the results of the in such way. Right? So again, um, it's a kind of dashboard and it should build that box code for the estrogen receptor gene, right? Uh, but let's say now it, may, it makes it interactive, right? So let's say I want to compare the estrogen receptor expression, right? And I'll just type submit. So here you can see that uh, estrogen receptor doesn't really change at all, right? And the negative versus positive. <laughs> and uh, again, that's probably how it should be. Uh, and we can type any other gene of interest uh, to make again show the interactivity. And so, if we look at the VGFA expression in the session, uh, is that negative versus positive birth cancer subtypes? Again, we don't see so much of a difference. Maybe they're slightly more overexpressed in the negative subtype rather than the positive one. But again, the one of the most drastic differences. You can observe for the estrogen receptor uh, again, right? Um, so uh, that pretty much uh, gives you an idea about the commands and uh, of this transmart our client package and the things that um, you can do using it. So it uh, makes it more flexible to uh, do all sorts of analysis. Uh, uh, Using this package. So, do you have any questions? If anyone has any questions, you can either raise your hand or uh, type a question. Uh, at this point, we're uh, at the end uh, of what we're, we're planning to present today. So, if anybody has a question, I would just unmute you and you can ask it. And it could be for either uh, Eugene or Kristen. Okay, so um, at the Datathon itself, uh, you, you will have access to the system, uh, access to these different tools. Uh, also, there will be, um, I think Eugene will be there. Uh, there'll be some people from the Transmar Foundation who are experts at using the platform, um, and they would uh, be available to help, you know, do uh, these types of analysis. And so, you know, our, our goal today was to introduce you to the platform, to introduce you to these tools, so you have some idea of what can be done, um, but you know we'll have we'll have people there on site with you uh, to try to help uh, make sure that you can do the these types of analysis uh, fairly quickly and easily. Um, you know so that you can ask the questions that, that you want and, and see the results. Um, also later this week uh, we will have a, a couple of other um, uh, uh, webinars to to talk about some other uh, tools. And so um, we'll have um, on tomorrow, um, let's see. Tomorrow we'll have uh, an overview of the, um, the, the webinar process and what our goals are and how we will actually uh, run, run the days. Uh, so you have an idea of you know how the the, um, the webinar will proceed uh, on Wednesday. Our colleagues from the University of Luxembourg will show the tools that they have created and some of the data sets that they've curated, uh, and uh, show you some examples of the types of things that you can do with the tools they have. They will also be present next week in Boston uh, at the, the Datathon, and then on Thursday we'll have it, uh, at least two vendors, Pergenomber to show Spotfire and Iowa Informatics. Uh, they will show their tools, and again, they will have um, some of their folks at the Datathon. So during the, those three days, next week, you'll have access to the system. You'll have access to a number of these tools, uh, and uh, you'll be able to use, you know, use the tools yourself, uh, if you like, or you'll be able to uh, rely on some of the people who are there at the, the Datathon itself. Um, I will be posting this recording uh, today. Uh, at our uh, transmartfoundation.org slash datathon 
uh, on our website. Uh, these will be in YouTube. You'll be able to, you can find them there directly if you want, but uh, we will have links right here on this page uh, directly to both this training class and also a couple of specific um, training videos that Kristen has created. Uh, and then um, later as the week, as we go ahead, we will have, um, uh, we'll also show uh, each of these webinars will also be posted here. So you come back to this page uh, and you'll see, you know, uh, some of the logistics of the, the datathon itself uh, are listed here on this page. Uh, as well as, um, you know, the descriptions of some of the data sets, the address and things. But in particular, um, we'll be listing here what's available, you know, in terms of all the, the webinars and the, the, the recordings that we have. So I want to thank everybody for uh, attending. Um, and uh, hopefully you'll come back tomorrow and uh, you'll learn a little bit more about how we're going to actually run the data fund. Uh, and uh, see what uh, what will take place next week. Thank you all today for coming, and um, hope we will see you tomorrow. Thank you for having Kristen.